Wow, what a patch. Welcome, guys. If you're out of the loop, uh, the devs revealed about 48 hours ago that there was going to be a serious release for Guild Wars 1 to celebrate its 15th anniversary. In this release, they said they were going to be adding some new weapons with weird attribute combinations and that they would be adding 10 new elite skills. One new elite skill for each of the professions in the game. And at that, the new elite skill was going to be a PvE only elite skill. What that means is hopefully the patch wouldn't mess with PvP too much. And what that would also mean is these new elite skills could be really powerful because they're specifically for the PvE area of the game. They wouldn't be able to be loaded onto heroes. Maybe this would be design that would encourage people to party up a little bit more in the game's twilight years and so on. And I have to say, it, even though they kind of did affect PvP here with this, I'll explain why very soon. This has been a really fun patch. In today's video, I'm going to talk you guys through my experience with it. We'll go through all 10 of the Elite skills. I'll try to keep this as a brief overview. But I have to say, I'm kind of gushing about the game at the moment. I spent, oof, a good 10 hours of the past 18 playing solidly, enjoying this new patch, and tinkering with the new builds. I'm here to show you what I've seen. So on this character here, my Mesmer, uh, I have actually collected all the elite skills. I produced a stream, it was about four hours long, in which I played through getting all of them. And here's what the process was like. Uh, as you may remember from the 10th anniversary, there is a system in place whereby during this event, there's currently, you know, a festival going on, when you complete a mission, one mission per region of the world per character on your account. So, you know, you complete one mission in Ascalon, you complete one mission in the Shiver Peaks, one mission in, uh, in Cryer and so on. And it can be in normal mode, it doesn't really matter, in each region, that counts for all three campaigns plus Eye of the North. So you can do this a lot of times. First time you do that, you get a special item. That item is called a Proof of Legend. As you can see here, on this character, I've got 10 that I've accumulated. I think over the course of this update so far, I've collected something like 35 of these. So, at uh, the 10th year anniversary, you could trade these for special weapons. This anniversary, there are new weapons, and also you can trade it for this item, the Proof of Triumph. It costs just 5. Once you have the Proof of Triumph, you can keep it on your account forever. And if a single player in the party it has this in their inventory when loading into special maps, it will spawn new boss. So even though the event's going to go away in a few days, you know, weeks, whatever, you can always year-round find someone who has this, party up with them, and spawn this boss. So, one of the new bosses spawns here at Perdition Rock. Perdition but Rock is one of the maps, which I actually guessed in the previous video I'm pretty happy with. There's a map over in Camphor, which is the Raisu Palace Explorable. So, the very end of the game, you've got to go to the Imperial Sanctum. There's uh, one in the Desolation for Nightfall. That's out at the Mouth of Torment. Uh, so, then finally, there is one in Eye of the North, which is kind of a weird one. They just randomly seem to have picked Sacknoth Valley. So, obviously, Sacknoth Valley is the only Eye of the North area that does not directly adjoin to an outpost. Which might be why the devs picked it. So, in a weird way, it's like the most end gamey of maps. I think that would be quite clever if that was their logic, but they have no statement on, on such a thing. In any case, you're going to go to the Doomlord Shrine and travel down here. And in each of these new maps, a new boss will spawn. There are ten professions, and split across the various bosses... All of those professions are covered. So here at Perdition Rock, there is a new creature called Abaddon's Tormented, I think it is. If you remember back in Vanilla, there's like a character called Balthazar's Corrupted or Balthazar's Tormented. It's one of those. And there's one for Dwayna and there's one for Melandru and so on. Well, now they've added a new one for Abaddon. Something that couldn't have actually existed way back at original Prophecies release. Because a lot of that lore about Abaddon hadn't really been implemented. But this new Abaddon-related enemy is a necromancer slash monk, I think it is. And from this character, you can capture two new elite skills. And that's how it works. So you're going to go around playing various missions, which, by the way, feel all surprisingly populated. It's really quite scary. You know, you can tunnel down into the quicker ones. You can say, all right, well, look, Augury Rock is clearly the fastest one in the Crystal Desert, so I'll just do that. Uh, Nightfall in particular, if you're trying to farm these, has a lot of really quick missions. There's a lot of, like, boss missions, which don't take long to do. Or, you know, the tutorial mission, Chabek Village, is very quick. 
you can kind of get through that campaign really fast. Uh, and then you're going to go out into these maps and cap the skills. And now let's roll through them. So let's talk, I guess, initially about Mesma. Since that's what I'm playing primary on right now, I'll give you my initial impressions. I have to say a lot of the community feedback that I've read about this has been sometimes eye-opening, sometimes really weird. And I think people have missed out on certain facets. So let's look. you got the Time Ward. Time Ward is a lot like Guild Wars 2's Time Warp. Uh, it's a ward that you place down and any ally that is standing in it uh, that's not a spirit. So this will affect minions and stuff, though obviously they don't really use skills. They cast spells faster and recharge skills faster. Uh, so, as of the original release, this was bugged and was recharging skills ludicrously fast. Multiple time wards would stack on top of one another and it was just very broken. There's actually been a follow-up patch for Guild Wars 1 since then. I didn't really read the details on it. I assume it might have been fixing this. Uh, it's an interesting skill mainly for the fact that it reduces skill recharge. So, there's like lots of shouts and... Special stances and strange things in the game that really you shouldn't be maintaining But now kind of can be especially if you stack them on top of like a BU You put a, uh, an essence of celerity on there and suddenly these skills are really coming down very quickly So I'm more excited about the recharge of skills than anything else You have to remember that this is a world where the skill stolen speed already exists Which is already kind of giving everyone fast casting in a way for spells But it's that recharge bit that's really quite interesting um, and that said, I don't really think I'll be playing it in many of my hero comps. I think that the even standard ba battle standard of honor for me, prob uh, not of honor, sorry, of wisdom probably covers most of what I want the time ward to do. The standard of wisdom hits the skill recharge anyway. So it's interesting. It's an obvious nod towards Guild Wars 2, which you're going to see in this patch they do a lot of, but there you have it. Again, I could actually probably give you like a 20 minute discussion on each of these, but we'll try and keep it brief. Uh, next, we'll look at the Ellie one, I guess, since I uh, seem to have Ellie uh, set up right now right now on this uh, weird build here. So, they are all primary attributes uh, skills as well, by the way. So, we just saw a fast casting one. Now, we're going to see an energy storage one. The fact that they're all primary attribute realistically means that if you want to play with a lot of these new skills, you might find yourself making new alts. Like, for example, I spent a lot of time in the past 24 hours building up a Necromancer in Guild Wars 1, which is a class I classically didn't play very much, just so I could utilize this new skill. I mean, I played a lot of Necro, but only ever in PvP, where it was easy to make Necros. So, the new one here is Over the Limit. It's uh, a bond. You actually maintain it on yourself. It's very cheap, but has a long cooldown, which is weird. I would say that the design behind this is to uh, toggle it a lot. But because of the long cooldown, it strikes me as really quite weak. Uh, while the Time Ward, I would say, is a very strong skill, I'd put in like an A tier, um, maybe even S tier for the patch, depending on where it sits in the end. Especially for speed clears and stuff, if that becomes really useful for people. The uh, This skill, I would actually say, is one of the weakest ones, I'm afraid. You might remember from my previous video about this patch that I was really hoping we would find something good for Ellie, because I just wanted to have that little bit more meat to it. And this just isn't that fun, really. So we just saw the Time Ward, which increases spell casting time for everyone and cooldown of skills for everyone. Well, this is like the same thing, but only for the Ellie. And the numbers are about the same. And it's it doesn't recharge all skills. It's your spells cast faster and your spells recharge faster. So it's not even all skills. And it comes with a monumental downside that is while you're maintaining it, it's continuously stacking exhaustion on your overcast, as the mechanic's now called. And yes, some skills synergize with overcast, but you would just get that overcast from casting an actual spell that would give overcast, like Meteor or something. This is really hard to deal with because you, you want to toggle it on just for a moment for the fight. So that you don't overcast ridiculously. If you just try and keep this on, which is what the spirit of a bond enchantment would be like, uh, then you're going to overcast the hell out of yourself. So you've got to toggle it on and off, but then the cooldown is prohibitive for that. You don't really get to enjoy the fact that it's a bond. And the effects aren't that strong. Now I will note, just like with Time Ward, this skill also has a bug in which apparently it's also giving like 80% spell recharge rate. Now 80% is huge. And I could imagine 
that this being a bond that costs a pip of energy and overcast you and can be denied by enchantment removal, a skill with all those downsides, but and is a PvE skill and is the elite slot might be justified if it was 80% on spells. And that would maybe even open some interesting farm choices and things. Uh, allow you to maintain certain earth uh, uh, magic um, enchantments and so on. But I don't know whether that's a bug. It probably is. I mean, don't we take the tooltip as the correct implementation? So it just seems like it's got these really weighty downsides. I can't find a method to it. There is another dimension of these skills I'll look at uh, in a moment. But there you go. So that's Ellie. That's two of the ten. Let's move on and stick with the classes for now, I guess. So we'll look at Necromancer. Necromancer is actually really interesting. And what I'll do... Um, well, we'll just roll over it first. It's called Soul Taker. So it's Soul Reaping. And it might not look that good at first. It's an enchantment that once you have enough Soul Reaping, you can maintain indefinitely. So don't worry about that. It means your attacks do lots more damage. It's like a turbocharged strength of honor for yourself. So you feel your melee attacks go really high. Like I've been using this with a scythe and hitting over 100 just randomly with swinging at people without any other buffs from people at the same time. But also every time you swing, you sacrifice health. So that obviously comes at a downside of maintenance. But the sacrifice of health is actually really useful in terms of making a build out of this. I'm going to come back to this skill uh, a little bit later in the video. But essentially what ArenaNet has done here is they've added the Guild Wars 2's Reaper to Guild Wars 1 with the implementation of this skill. And once again, a lot of stuff seems to just be looking forward to Guild Wars 2. And for that reason, we might even see some hints about Ellie later. Next, uh, let's roll on to Monk. Um, Monk, I would actually say, is one of the weaker ones as well. It seems like more of a flavor choice from the devs. Like, they kind of wanted to create a fun new play style. But I'm not sure that a, a PvE-exclusive elite skill is the place to put something that really is just tinkery. But we'll see. Um, and, of course, I'm appreciative of any update even uh, for this game at this point, even if it is, you know, fairly weak. So it's Divine Favor. The new skill is Judgment Strike. It's very strange. Easy to ca uh, cast. Five energy, one cast time, 15 second recharge. It's, you know, a pretty good skill for like a throwaway skill. But it's a melee attack. An elite PvE only melee divine favor attack. Now that is a weird combo. Attack target and adjacent foes. Each attack that hits deals extra holy damage and knocks down attacking foes. So, if you want to run a Monk Primary Warrior Secondary that's running around with a hammer, you've got like a really cheap, spammable knockdown here that might be fun to play with. Obviously, you don't have to do a hammer. This is a melee attack. It could be any, any melee weapon that you're utilizing this with. You could use this with daggers and then follow this straight into Falling Spider or something and go from there. I will note that this has a lot of synergies with smiting, and I think what they're doing is like a smite combo thing. It might be because Guild Wars 2 has a uh, hammer on the Guardians, so that again, it's just trying to nod forward. But you have like, um, I'm not going to be able to find it here, but you have like uh, spells for the uh, monk, which is do extra damage to people who are on the ground, right? There's two of them, well, they're, they're basically duplicates. So you could maybe combo it with that. And also, they added a new weapon. Much with the Necromancer thing, they kind of seem to add a weapon that synergizes with this somehow. But overall, I would say this is a weird one, and it kind of feels strange. Especially when you consider that Signet of Judgment exists. Signet of Judgment does not require your squishy armor character to wade into melee. It's also a knockdown. The only, the only difference is that, and this one's free to cast with a slightly longer cooldown. The main difference is that Signet of Judgment will only knock one guy down, while the Elite skill will knock down in AoE. But both of them do AoE damage, so I don't know. I think Signet of Judgment is just way better. So, uh, that is the Monk. And then finally, for casters, let's have a look at the Ritualist one. The Ritualist one I would describe as fun, but I'm not I'm necessarily sure it's that OP. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So, Weapons of Three Forges. You're going to capture this one out of the Raisu Palace mission. Uh, it's going to spam everyone with a weapon skill. So... For three seconds, but when you have high spawning power, it's for quite a long time, honestly. Every non-spirit ally in earshot gains the effect of a weapon spell. So, at earshot range, all allies getting random weapons. This is really something to behold, guys. And in fact, I can demo this to you. 
because it's it, it's in the the feeling of the skill I think that really comes out on this one. Um, how how cool this is. Basically, what you can do. And let me just for complete sake, let's summon a Ruby Jin here. What you can do is trigger the skill, and if I was a Rit, obviously this would last for ages. You get all these weapons, and don't forget that natively. The spawning power uh, line lengthens weapon duration and the spell, you know, scales weapon duration as well. So these weapons are going to be lingering on people for ages. And it's just really fun to press one button, see everybody get a weapon. Not everyone in your team obviously is going to be a caster, but here's the real kicker, guys. It's not just easy to use and throw out, but it will hit allies too. So my Ruby Jin, who will actually spam immolate and won't necessarily get any value out of it, also gets a weapon and your minions also get weapons so if you combo this with like 30 minions you're getting like 30 weapons out this is amazing it's great you know you're gonna get all these random weapons of shadow that blind everything and splinter weapons and brutal weapons elite weapons can roll out of this i've seen like um you know uh, uh jinrei come out of this i've seen so much weird stuff happen it's very, 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 very cool, I think. It might not be that effective unless you really build around it. I think that on the PVX wiki over the coming weeks, you might hopefully see a team comp that revolves around this and Ritualist will have some really fun special specialist playstyle to go for. I think a lot of people think of bone minions when they think of minions. And yeah, it's cool to think your minion wall runs in and splats the hell out of everyone. One of the main things people like doing at the moment already is putting like a splinter weapon on the bone minions. But I actually think Bone Fiends are the ones to be looking at here. So Bone Fiends are the ones that are ranged, so they just plonk down and rapid fire through. They, you know, they'll burn through the weapons quick. And uh, so some kind of composition that's using that, this standard, probably the standard of honor, and going with the Bone Fiends, that could be really fun to see. You're going to get a lot of effects out of that. So this skill's pretty fun. If you're relying on weapons for defense in any way, if you just want to spam spin a weapon, if you're really efficiently minded about it, I think that this might look like an S-class skill and it's probably actually more down to a B-class thing and it's something you really have to build around, but it's fun. And for that reason, it's one of my favorites of the whole patch. So that's the cast is done. Uh, so then the other side of the game are going to be the martial and sort of medium guys. We'll start with Warrior since he's at the top of the list. Warrior is also ludicrously fun. It's strength, obviously, and I'm not going to be able to demonstrate that well because I don't have much strength. It's called Seven Weapon Stance. It's a indefinitely maintainable stance that gives you an attack speed bonus, which already on its own, you know, is decent enough, all right? But then it also, and you know, there's no downside or whatever. It increases your weapon attributes. And so here on the tooltip, you'll see that it says by one, and you might think, well, that's rubbish. Guys, when you have lots of strength, this increases your weapon attributes. By like 15. Not sets to 15. Increases by 15. So what this means, essentially, is you can have level 20 weapon investment in all the weapons you could ever care to have all at once. And for anyone out of touch with Guild Wars 1, getting if just for free to level 20 on all that stuff without rune investment or without you know, uh, consumables investment, just to have that, is so nuts. So, that would be your swordsmanship is all the way up, you could have your hammer all the way up, axe all the way up, and even better, secondary professions as well. So, it, it, what will actually happen, a really cool weird thing with the UI, when you press this, a bunch of new attributes appear on your UI. You see dagger mastery appears, and you see scythe mastery appears, and you see spear mastery appears, and bow mastery appears. So, what this does is it opens up a ton of new concepts for Warrior that are using weapon swapping. Which, again, is like a guilt, very, very, very Guild Wars 2-y kind of experience. Um, I find weapon swapping in Guild Wars 1 kind of clunky. So, personally, is this enough for me to build into my Warrior, you know, as a, a highlight of the patch instantly? No. But I see a lot of weird applications. There's a cool idea of basically having a mixed melee and ranged build. Where you're swapping on a bow very comfortably every now and then. Or you're swapping on a spear. Especially spear. They added a new spear to the game that might synergize with this. We'll look at it in a moment. But this is really nuts. So, and, and there's so many attributes. 15! You could do all kinds of weird stuff and just weapon swap through. And I'd like to see what players go with on that one. Really, I'd like to see. Pretty crazy. I'd put that pretty high. That's like a B or an A for me, definitely. 
Um, next we have Ranger. So Ranger is probably one of the strongest ones that they added. Maybe people are overestimating it. And maybe a bit like the richest one we have to build into it. Sorry, I'm stalling here. I'm just desperately trying to find expertise on the list. There it is, expertise. Um, so the new skill is called Together as One. It's a shout. It basically feels like a Beast Mastery skill. But they didn't put it in Beast Mastery. They put it in the primary. And once again, it's maintainable. You notice so many of them are at that sweet spot of like 10, 1, 15 or 5, 1, 15. And then they linger for about 3 to 20 seconds. They're all reasonably maintainable. So this is all party members. No longer allies. I know we've seen a lot of stuff where they just threw it on all allies. And you might wonder if that's because they forgot about the distinction between party member and allies. No, no, no. This is party members. Uh, everyone gets... Uh, additional damage with their strikes, their attacks, and health regeneration. And the health regeneration actually goes really high. It's like plus six health regeneration that you can just maintain at earshot level on your whole team. So this is a really strong way of shoring up the defenses of your your whole group. There is no like equivalent in Guild Wars 1 to like a Guild Wars 2 Scholar Rune or something where this would really be shining. But still, it's massive amounts of defense and really significant offense as well. I mean, once again, it's that thing of like how many of your characters are really attacking. You might look at that and you'd be like, wow, eight characters doing these massive extra numbers and all their strikes. It depends how you set your heroes up, really, and how much wanding they're doing or how much melee striking that they're doing to really get a lot of value. It's obviously going to help you a lot, though, because you can run it. This is not a preparation. So you can run this with skills like volley and every and fire out multiple arrows and they all do extra damage. It's not just, I, I mean, it says extra damage on your attacks. So I'm not sure whether it's like the standard of honor where this would hit like ignite arrows and every little packet you do. But the more you're attacking, the better, the faster, the better. So yes, it's very, very decent and uh, really just useful pretty much, you know, just a solid, solid skill. Not that inspired, but extremely solid. I will note here in editing, this is obviously contingent on being nearby you or the pet. So the pet buffs all your frontline characters and you buff the backline characters. So it should in general just sort of work itself out, but it's not like everyone in earshot all the time. Also, another weird thing, this is the only shout in Guild Wars 1 with a cast time. They've implemented it. A similar thing happened with the sequel. So that's Ranger. We're down to just uh, a couple more now. Over at Assassin. So Assassin is actually absurdly strong. And I do have an Assassin set up. And this is not reliant on the new weapons that they added. So I think I'll just show you guys it. I think that Assassin is S tier. I think it is by far the strongest new elite skill in the game. Assassin was already very strong before the patch. Uh, just with its dagger spam combos. And the thing is, one of the things that was so strong about Assassin was it wasn't really requiring an elite skill. Uh, anything could have slotted into it, and that made it prime and predisposed to really benefit from this patch. So what did the devs do? Well, they added a shadow step. It's called Shadow Theft. Uh, and I, first of all, I think adding a shadow step is a great idea, because the existing shadow steps, like Death Charge and stuff in the game, uh, they're kind of long cooldown, and like once Death Charge is done, you don't really get that experience of port, port, port. Guild Wars 2 did that a lot better. And you know, you don't really want to run like Aura of Displacement or other weird shit like that. You kind of just want to teleport a lot. And so this is a nice, refreshable, low cooldown shadow step that you can spam from group to group in generic PvE encounters. And then they just turbocharge it. So it's only 5 energy. It buffs you, but the buff is not an enchantment, so it can't be ripped. This really should have been an enchantment arena net, or like a stance or something. Uh, so, check it out. This is a high investment. We pour in, and for the next 19 seconds, our foe loses attribute investment by 5. Which means that you are genuinely going to incapacitate a lot of enemies in normal mode when you do this. Which is huge. But my attributes, all attributes, are increased by 5. So, this basically means you get to run around... With 20 dagger, and, and by the way, this will feed into itself, okay? So, once I trigger this the first time, my crit strikes will go to 19. And then, this will actually, by, say, by 6. And I'll do it again, and my crit strikes will go to 20. 
So I've only got level 14 crit strikes and level 14 dagger mastery. But with this skill, what I actually have is level 20 crit strikes, level 20 dagger mastery. And it's fully maintainable. It's a skill that enemies can never rip from you. And then whatever like secondary ideas I roll into, I could also buff the hell out of. So my shadow arts is actually super high. It's investment seven. So you'll see here I'm running shadow theft and death's charge. Having both I found is really fun. It makes the dagger spammer extremely versatile. Just snap down kills really quickly. I actually gathered a ton of footage, but to keep this video concise, I won't keep rolling with that. And then what it means is whatever you go with for your secondary, you know, if you're spamming save yourselves, cool, fine, fair enough. But if you're like Paragon secondary for go for the eyes, for minions, or, or you know, just to get more crits, the go for the eyes will be super strong. Or you can run Demonic Flesh here. And Demonic Flesh will actually be extremely strong. So, you know, this has always been great combo. Whenever I use one of these skills, it splashes AoE damage around me. Well, now, I'm, I, I get really high blood magic investment for zero compromise. My blood magic is going to be level 13, guys. 13! As if I'm a necro main and I've actually ruined it up. And yeah, I got that for free. My main attributes are still level 20. They're still capped out. So that's really heavy. Or you can have level 13 Beast Mastery and put Comfort Animal in there. And you'd have a really killer pet with you. It's very, very... It's a fun skill in how it uses. It's extremely potent. It opens a few new build options and paths. The Assassin one is unquestionably S tier. It is the strongest by far. And um, I foresee myself doing a lot more dagger spamming in the coming days. And just because I can mess with that last slot or those last two slots, hard, depending on how you want to play it. I think, uh, I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with that one. A lot of fun. Uh, you might have noticed that the duration is 19 seconds on that, but the cooldown is 20, So, and I said it feeds into itself. Don't forget, occasionally you'll kill a boss, or sometimes you'll just get a lower skill recharge or something, and uh, it's in those situations that it then creates like the feedback loop. I did want to be clear that that is pretty common to happen. The other thing I just want to be clear to articulate here is the feel of this elite skill is one of the reasons I think it's been so good in this patch. It feels great to shadow step regularly, to see yourself incapacitate enemies, to feel the weight of having level 20 on both of these attributes. Some of these other uh, abilities don't feel fun to use necessarily. They might just be fire and forget or outright annoying to use. Assassin is a pleasure. So let's hit Dervish next since he's the other medium armor. So it's mysticism. This one's weird and I haven't really done much th theory craft with it. But could be interesting. It's called the Vow of Revolution. You'll notice all these skill icons are basically recolored Guild Wars 2 icons in a lot of ways by the way. Like the one we just saw for Thief is a recolored shadow step, I was told. I didn't notice until I saw until people told me that. So Vow of Revolution, this is for it's a maintainable enchantment that gives you massive energy regeneration. It's like plus five energy regeneration. So you can spam, basically, because you've got so much energy regeneration. And it refreshes every time you use a skill that does not belong to the dervish. So the whole idea is play heavy mysticism. And I'm not sure what other mysticism skills really synergize here, frankly. Like, you'd want other good mysticism skills for this to really shine. And then, uh, you would just play whatever you want. Do you want to be a protection prayers monk? Go for it. Do you want to be a healing prayers monk? Go for it. Do you want to be a fire spammer, an earth magic guy? Do you want to be, you know, um, a deadly arts uh, instead? Do anything you want. It doesn't have to be spells. Any skill will refresh this. This elite is a hell of a lot like the Mesmer's Lissa's Aura. The difference is that Lissa's Aura requires you to be using spells and spells that target foes. And, and then you can do the same thing. This skill is way more liberating. You can do any playstyle you like, pretty much, and just spam stuff out. And they added a, a weapon that kind of supports this playstyle. I just don't know what's really cool about this. You know, like, we already have, like, Ether Renewal Monks and stuff like that. This can't be loaded onto a hero bar. So, you know, you, you have to be the player doing that. It essentially means you're a lot more versatile and you can play around in PvE a lot more as a dervish. But does it really open something really, like, strong? I don't know. I haven't thought of that. Maybe, maybe it does. I'm just not entirely sure right now. Another thing is, I genuinely think one of the strongest hero builds in the game at the moment is a Blood is Power Necro Ritualist. So I have this energy regeneration anyway. I didn't need this elite skill. I don't know. I'm just a bit uninspired. So that's dervish. The last one is Paragon, which I've also played a lot with. And like the Assassin one, I think it's S tier. It's not that fun to use, but here it is. So it's called Heroic Refrain. It's an elite echo. Now, here's the funny thing. If we sort by type on Paragon, 
You see, the only elite echo we had before was not an echo you could actually cast on allies. And it wasn't an echo that refreshed either. So we didn't really have something filled in there. The devs have done that. So adding an echo that refreshes on Shout End actually fills a mechanical niche I have wanted filled for Paragon for years. So I am really happy with that alone. And then the effect on top is bonkers. Now, I know we've already seen a lot of really absurd stuff about, like, attributes getting bumped up. But this one kind of does the same to an even crazier degree. This is plus five to all attributes permanently as long as you're just refreshing it. I personally chose to use there on fire on a standard um, save yourselves looking build. So this is like massive damage reduction. This will buff yourself and itself. So once you cast this on yourself, you have 20 leadership. And it's actually plus 6 to all attributes. And then you can buff your whole team with plus 6 to all attributes. And everyone is running around like a hard mode monster basically with 20. And I'll tell you that improves our own skill bar. They're on fire. Goes to like 45% damage reduction. Uh, there is nothing to fear. Will last for ages. It's almost like nearly maintainable. So the standard skill bar also gets stronger from this. This particularly synergizes with Mesmers I found. I've, I've done a whole campaign playthrough using this as the buffer. And I've done a whole campaign playthrough... Receiving this with someone else giving it to me receiving it on a mesmer that was just spamming domination stuff So I had level 19 fast cast and level 20 domination was so insane Like I could just spam skills so fast and they would recharge so fast and they would hit so so hard I think people undervalue the idea of getting extra attributes. There are a lot of weird skills in the game that have like weird breakpoints only at like 19 attributes or only at 20 attributes. And this gets you to those interactions. Previously unviable mechanics are there now. It also makes minion monsters ludicrously strong as I experienced while I was playing. You're running around with like level 22 regular minions. You can get level 34 flesh golems. Just because of this skill and if you roll like a plus one on Master of My Domain. And it's costing you nothing for consumables. And you don't have to run other spells like Masochism and whatever. This buffs the hell out of Ellie's that you might be running with. That now get 20, you know, investment in multiple lines at once. It's really good for hybrid playstyles. Because, you know, it's very costly to get that last tick. So if instead you just go to like 14. Well, you can go really heavy in a ton of attributes on any build that you like. And all of them are now going to be like level 12, level 13, whatever. You know, they're going to be really high. I Again, I, I mentioned the idea of pets before for the assassin thing. I actually think it's really strong here as well. Don't forget that beast mastery, some lines just buff the strength of a skill. But other lines do way more than that. Like if you look at beast mastery, it doesn't just buff beast mastery skills. It increases the damage that the pet's doing. So you can just slap a couple of points in there, throw a random charm animal, and all of a sudden you've got really vicious pets running around in your composition because of heroic uh, refrain. There's so much stuff you can do. I'm especially excited about the idea of these skills that have special breakpoints late in, you know, around 18, 19, 20, that now you can reliably believe in, you know, and think about like bonds and stuff. So, uh, you know, the application in like farms where you heroic refrain a bonder, or something, let the, the, the bonder do their work, and then like DC that character out, and now they've got a ton of attributes. There's loads of weird things that can happen out of this, guys. I think it's fantastic. I did mention that it's a bit unfun to use. Unfortunately, that's just kind of a thing with echoes, right? Really what we need is user interface that shows when an echo is active or not, and then I think it would be a lot more fun to use. But clicking through everyone in the party and slowly ramping it up and spamming there on fire just to keep it going is kind of a weird, unfun interaction. Maybe the devs back in the day understood that and that's why they never added an elite of this style in this category. But I'm happy now that it's here and that it's pretty strong to boot. So, and, and again, I would put that as one of the top tier skills that came out. Oh, also, you got the fact that Paragon really wasn't doing anything too unique. You know, Imbagon was very much conflicting with, like, the idea of soul twisting. And, and now they have a thing. So, very fun. Right, uh, that leaves us with one other side of the patch, which actually I think is a really fascinating side of the patch. Um, and so, it's over at the Great Temple. It's over at Embark Beach. I think apparently at Heroes Ascent there's a new vendor as well. 
uh, at the vendor where we initially buy this proof of triumph. Um, and it involves the new weapons that they added. So, I have to say, five years ago, I don't know what was going on with Guild Wars 2 at the time. I guess we were just moving into Heart of Thorns and I was feeling very busy with that. I never properly covered this, but at the 10 year anniversary, when these proofs initially got added, the devs added these green weapons. These are all very special and interesting and kind of feel like legendaries, really, like Guild Wars 1 legendaries. I never talked about any of them. I'll spare you in this video before the runtime gets too long, but if you want to see me talk about these, like for example, the fact that the axe kind of lets you dual wield in Guild Wars 1, even though that's not a real mechanic, I totally will. But for this new 15th anniversary, they added a new set of weapons too. And it strikes me that these are all specifically are made with the, or many of them are made with the new elite skills in mind. So I do want to run through them in this video. These are, ju these just came out today. So um, while the 10th anniversary, these green ones are like skins, these ones actually have mechanical specialties. Let's run through them. So first, we have an Ellie weapon, which I'm actually going to come to at the end, because this one's especially weird, and you'll see why after we've done the others. There's a flat bow for spawning power, so this is a weird combination that means your uh, spirit, your SOS spirit spammer can pull a little bit more effectively. You can fire with a bow instead of just wandering away, I guess. You can do a bit of weapon swapping. I'm not sure how it really synergizes with the new uh, Elite, except that the new Elite... Is a you know triggers random weapons everywhere, and maybe they want you to use this flat bow and you know spam out multi packet hits with all your weapon effects. There's also the fact that this could be again, as many of the elite skills themselves were, this could be looking at Guild Wars 2 and just referencing Guild Wars 2. That's all it's doing. And what this might be referencing is the Renegade, right? Revenant in Renegade feels very ritualisty because Renegade, sp you know, basically spirit spams, and Renegade got a short bow, and this is a flat bow, which is close enough, right? I think it's even clearer that they're referencing Guild Wars 2 with this one. Here we have an assassin, a critical strikes short bow. So that's probably because Thief got short bow in Guild Wars 2. I'm like 100% confident that's why the devs did it. It's just like to let you kind of play that role. Now, let's talk about the idea of actually using a bow here, but not being slash ranger. Because you don't need to take marksmanship anymore. And you could totally do that. And what that's going to do is buff your damage while pulling. Or when you're fighting around a mob that you can't normally hit. Or you could totally still go slash ranger and build into marksmanship. It's an interesting idea that ArenaNet are going with. But apparently there's a hidden mechanic in the game that's never really been relevant before this patch. Which is called like strike multiplier. That means even if you hit the attribute requirement. If you're not actually investing in the attribute line. Your, your damage output is going to be really low. So... I know it sounds really cool, like I could be an assassin slash warrior using a bow and it would still work because this requires crit strikes. I think you actually still do super low damage and you kind of still need to invest in the secondary. And that's a shame, maybe the devs will patch it, I don't have my breath held though. And it kind of breaks like the core idea for a lot of these, I'm afraid. But there you have it, and I'm pretty sure it's a good one to reference. There's these daggers, but they're leadership, so this is Paragon using daggers. Doesn't necessarily synergize with the new elite, but what I think that is is a reference to the Guild Wars 2 Spellbreaker, right? Paragon is pretty much a Spellbreaker, and now you can run around on daggers with it. Again, because of that weird strike multiply mechanic, I, I think you still do kind of have to go Assassin Secondary and build into Dagger Mastery. But, I mean, it would be really nice if the devs changed these. Here, we have a Divine Favor Hammer, which is especially special because it doesn't do blunt damage. It does holy damage, innately. So here you have it. This is a clear synergy that they're aiming for with the new Monk Elite skill that knocks down in melee. You could run these together for like a flavor thing if you wanted. You don't have to, obviously. And it is a bit strange. Could just be referencing that in Guild Wars 2, the Guardian has Hammer. Now here's a really amazing one. So this is the Anniversary Scythe, the Sufferer. So this is Soul Reaping Scythe. Now, remember the elite skill, the necro elite skill, which is every time you attack, you do way more damage, but life siphon. Well, uh, sorry, sacrifice. Well, here, you've got something really powerful in your hands. The devs are clearly looking for you to link the two, and in fact, I have done. So, the idea here behind this build, and I spent an inordinate amount of time getting attribute points and stuff uh, to do this, 
um, on this random uh, necro I have. If you run Soul Taker, every time you swing with a scythe, you will sacrifice three times. Your scythe will hit like a truck and you'll triple sacrifice. So if you run Dark Aura, every time you sacrifice health, you do massive shadow damage, AoE. You're going to get three hits out of the scythe plus three hits out of Dark Aura. And if you run Demonic Flesh, every time you use a weapon skill, you do massive damage. So basically they have added the Guild Wars 2 Reaper as a Guild Wars 1 build. I'm sure that's what they're going for. I'm like slowly building into this. If you guys are really interested, I'd love to do a video later down the line where I really show the complete version of this. I've got a lot of ideas for cool dervish skills and stuff. Um, it, you may remember someone who used to collab on my channel years ago, Magical Mike. I actually played the game talking to him about this a lot last night. And uh, he was doing this on a dagger spammer variant. So you just super fast spam out these dagger attacks. Proc a ton of demonic flesh, a ton of dark aura and soul taker. It's a new build, guys. And it's like a melee... Necro variant. Really, really interesting. And that scythe kind of plays into it beautifully. What I would also say about the scythe as well is the damage type on it. Much like how that hammer was doing holy damage, this scythe does dark damage. So you kind of get a, a different damage typing on there. Dark, realistically, that doesn't mean very much. It's shadow damage that's the armor ignoring one. So, you know, you're still hitting armor calculations like normal. But you get to do that special thing, and that's definitely what the devs are doing. Here you've got a fast casting shield. It's obviously just there because they're referencing the Chrono in Guild Wars 2. But this actually affects PvP in a big way, to the point I've seen quite a few people complaining. As in, Mesmers, now when they swap on their shield, actually get a lot of armor. And they get that, and there's no parity. Other professions don't get that. So that's a bit of an iffy one. You also can't just instantly get these items on PvP tunes. You can only get them during the festival on PvE tunes. So now you've got a weird thing where PvE characters are doing better in PvP. Or, you know, you've got more jump hoops to jump through. So I'm not sure. And the reason for that, by the way, is everything you buy from this vendor is instantly customized to that character. The devs could fix this, fix this issue by removing that. I actually wasted some proofs because of that. I didn't realize that. So be careful with that, guys. Uh, next, you've got a spear, a strength spear. So this one's quite interesting because... Obviously, Spear doesn't exist in Guild Wars 2, so they can't really be nodding to anything. But what I wonder is if maybe it's nodding to something that is unreleased or might come later. And that's the idea that if in Guild Wars 2 they ever added the Paragon, I think putting it on Warrior would be... A, if a Paragon Elite Specialization exists in the sequel, Warrior would use it, right? I think it would work perfectly. And so here you've got a Strength Spear. Does this open up Guild Wars 2 builds... Uh, Guild Wars 1 builds, sorry. Absolutely yes! Because the new Warrior Elite gives you a ton of Spear Mastery. So, you know, the fact that this requires strength doesn't really matter too much. But I think you can mix Spear Chucking with melee stuff. And you could do some, some fun, weird things. But again, I wonder what that's nodding to. I think that's nodding to the idea that a Paragon would be on a Warrior in Guild Wars 2, maybe. Also, importantly, by the way, this weapon does also affect PvP, sort of. Warriors that just swap to like a spear shield set to build some adrenaline are now hitting more damage because, you know, they're hitting the attribute requirement. Not a ton more damage because, again, the strike multiplier mechanic undermines the entire idea of these new weapons, but they will do more damage. Next, and nearly at the end here, we've got a Mysticism Staff. So remember the Dervish Elite spam spells constantly or skills? Well, if you want to do that on the back line, well, hey, here's a Mysticism Staff for you. And unlike many of the others, this one's actually kind of useful because, you know, it's only there for the, the holy damage that you get on the autos. Uh, it's kind of irrelevant, to be honest. But there you have it. A star for the back line if you want to, you know, combo them together for flavor purposes. And then finally, a sword for Ranger. An expertise sword. Obviously, the Guild Wars 2 Ranger has swords, so that's probably just what they're doing. It's all a little bit uninspired, just adding them because it's Guild Wars 2 things. It all kind of reeks of... Do the Guild Wars 1 devs feel a little bit out of touch and they don't really know what fun combos would have been? Like a fun combo that Guild Wars 1 players probably really would have appreciated would have been a Shadow Arts staff. Stuff like that. But, um, you know, they, they went with this. Let's return to our old friend now. The Ellie one. A Cold Damage Axe. So how does that synergize with the new uh, the new elite skill? Maybe it's suggesting that you're meant to use that new elite skill to use big water enchantment hexes and uh, 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 water magic enchantments and stuff. I could buy that, or maybe not. 
here's the thing. Ellie in Guild Wars 2 doesn't have axe. So it's not referencing that. They can conjure a fiery axe, but they deliberately make this one cold damage. And here's the thing as well. The fact that in Guild Wars 2 they can conjure fiery axes is literally because there are the conjure skills in Guild Wars 1. That's already like a reference that's going on. So what are the devs doing here? I think this might be a hint to a new elite specialization somewhere. Maybe upcoming with the Canther expansion or something. Maybe Ellie gets axed somewhere down the line. Kind of makes sense, I guess. Because, I mean, why, why is this cold damage? And what exactly is this referencing there? So there you have it, guys. There's some new builds. There's some new ideas. There's some new weapons you can play with. There is the matter of the 10th anniversary and all that stuff. But I will leave this video here. That's kind of how the patch goes. I've had so much fun. I've been building loads of weird cool comps. I definitely recommend you guys get in because I can't believe how active this game is as well at all of that. And I hope you guys have enjoyed my coverage. Please let me know if you have. If you support videos like this, let it be seen. And I'll be encouraged to continue doing them. You know, I really felt like Guild Wars 1 was a game that I was moving on from and not really thinking about much. But the game has really gripped me lately. Really gripped me. I've got a lot of videos lined up about it for you, even completely unrelated to this update. So thanks, guys. Thanks to ArenaNet for a brilliant 15th anniversary. I hope to see more. I really do. If they can do it, hopefully there's some revenue they get out of it because it would be the best thing for this franchise, I feel. Thanks, guys. And I'll see you next time. Let me know what you think.